Hello guys, how are you? I'm Hadeep Singh. Welcome back to your own YouTube channel. IELTS updates and recent exams. For more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing test topics, listening, reading, practice test, and speaking, you can just work. Please guys, participate in every day listening and reading practice test to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page IELTS updates and recent exams. Part 1 You will hear a woman asking about restaurants in a holiday town. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Good morning. This is the Tourist Information Line. How can I help you? Hello, my name is Susie Cross and I'm coming to Gladwell next summer with my family for a holiday. Do you need help with accommodation options? No, thank you. A friend has offered us her holiday house for two weeks, so we will be staying there. I'd like to know if there are any restaurants in the area. It's my husband's birthday while we're there and I'd like to celebrate it. Gladwell has 12 restaurants, which are all excellent. It just depends on what type of dining experience you're looking for. For example, three of the restaurants specialize in seafood. You read my mind. As it is a coastal town, I thought that would be the best option. Can you tell me a bit about the restaurants? The house we are going to stay in on is on Ocean View Drive. It would be really useful if we were able to walk to and from the restaurant. What is the number of the house? All three restaurants are close to Ocean Drive, but it is quite long. It's number 42. So, are you up the northern end of town? What a lovely spot. It's very close to the Dunbar. If you walk towards the town centre from the house, it's on the cross street, going up the hill. It's probably about a ten-minute walk. Or you could catch a taxi. Anyway, the food is quite fancy. The chef has won lots of awards and people come to town particularly to go to this restaurant. You would have to book well in advance. Price-wise, it is on the expensive side and is about £100 per head. That's good to know. I don't really mind if it's on the expensive side, as long as I'm prepared for it. We are saving so much on accommodation that we can afford to splash out a bit when we eat out. It would be nice to live it up for a couple of weeks. You mentioned two other restaurants? Yes, another one is the catch of the day. It's a more family-friendly restaurant in the centre of town. It is on the main promenade, so you can catch a bus directly there in about five minutes. Keep in mind, though, that buses stop at midnight and it would be a long walk home, so I suggest a taxi. The restaurant will be able to call one for you. The food there is excellent, but more your basic fish and chips and salad type fare. A full meal with dessert will be about £40 per person. They cater for groups there, and there is musical entertainment. It's a fun place, but can be a bit on the noisy side if you are looking for a quiet evening. Before you listen to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. I think we're looking for something a bit more intimate. There's nothing worse than not being able to hear each other because of loud music or noisy customers. The Dunbar is starting to sound like the best option. The third option is an Italian seafood restaurant called Giovanna's. I love Italian food. Where is the restaurant? It's in an old building at the port in the old part of town, very close to where the fishing boats come in every day. 
The bus takes about 10 minutes. Is it child friendly? I've got two little ones aged six and eight. Absolutely. Children are welcome. This might be just the place for you. A three course meal costs about 50 pounds a head. I can assure you personally that the food is delicious. I eat there myself quite frequently. The staff are very friendly and give good advice about what to choose from the menu. And there is a child's menu available. Another thing, if you are celebrating a birthday, you can order a cake from them to come out at dessert with candles. You don't want to be baking a birthday cake while you are on a holiday, do you? Giovanna's is one of Gladwell's oldest restaurants and has been run by the same family for about 50 years. Giovanna was the original chef, but I think her daughter is in charge of the kitchen these days. The restaurant is quite tiny. It only seats about 50 people. Well, all this is food for thought. I have to have a think about what kind of evening we want. Thank you very much for your advice. It was a pleasure. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. You will hear a man called Christian Jackson, staff coordinator of a trade fair facility, showing a new employee a map of the facility. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Hello Josephine, my name is Christian Jackson and as you are starting work at the trade fair today I'd like to show you around the area you're going to be working in. Let's look at this map first. You can see that this is the entrance here where you have just come in and where we are standing now at the information booth is adjacent to it. This will be the main area that you will be working in from 9 o'clock today. As you know, this week the trade fair is the toy fair and you will be expected to be able to direct people to any part of the fair they wish to go to. If you are unsure about anything while giving information, make sure to ask other members of staff. Giving the correct information is your main focus. You have an hour and a half between now and nine o'clock. So that should be a good amount of time to have a good walk around and get yourself familiar with the place. I don't think you'll find it too difficult to work out where everything is. The trade fair is broken up into three main halls. To the left of the information booth here is the entrance to the Brooklyn Hall, which contains traditional toys like board games, dolls, stuffed toys and arts and crafts materials. You will also find model building kits and all the different building block brands. At the very back of the hall is the lecture theatre, where different companies will be giving presentations and launches all day. Opposite the information booth and across the floor of this main area is the Sanderson Hall. It is home to all the multimedia toys like video games, computer software and pretty much any electronic equipment. If you turn left when you enter Sanderson Hall, you will see the Wi-Fi zone, which has recharging facilities and Wi-Fi access. Next to the Wi-Fi room is the Internet Café, which is a good place for people to meet, have a coffee and use their computers. See how easy it is to remember so far? On the south wall of the main area, just over there, you can see the entrance to another hall, and next to that are the toilets. The south entrance goes into the Carmichael Hall, which has all the sports equipment, from running shoes to bicycles. 
Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. There were plans to have each of the sporting groups such as tennis and football centralised and positioned together, but this made it too difficult for the companies that cater for more than one sport to know where to go, and companies didn't want to be placed right next to their competitors. So the stands are randomly placed. Therefore, it is important for you to remember the positions of the bigger sporting brands. On the south wall of the hall are meeting rooms for people to do deals. On the eastern wall, there is a self-service restaurant and a large cafe with a seating area next to it. So, here is your map. You are expected to work until 5pm and you can have a half-hour break at some stage to have some lunch. We will give you a £10 voucher to use at the self-service restaurant. Rosemary Jonas is in charge of the information booth today, so she will tell you when you can do that. Otherwise, you need to register at the information booth now and get your identification tags. You need to wear these around your neck at all times, and you can use this orange card to get through the turnstiles every day for the next nine days. As you know, because this is a short contract, you will not be paid penalties for working on Saturdays and Sundays, though we will pay you overtime if you have to work late any of the days. Here is a timesheet for you to fill in the hours you work every day, and you need to get this signed off each day by the person who is in charge of the information booth that day. Give it to me on the last day, but make sure you keep a copy to give to your employment agency. Do you have any questions? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. You will listen to an interview with Dr. Temple Grandin, who is in a unique position to provide parents and professionals insight into autism because she had autism. She was diagnosed at the age of two and has lived a very challenging and adventurous life. Dr. Grandin has presented lectures on autism around the world and has appeared on many national television programs. The interview is conducted by Dr. Stephen Edelson. Now you have some time to look at questions Listen to the interview conversation and answer questions. What is your earliest recollection and how old were you? I was in a summer program when I was just a real little child, about three. I can remember playing around in a wading pool. When I was three and a half years old, I can also remember quite a few things. I can remember the frustration of not being able to talk. I knew what I wanted to say, but I could not get the words out, so I would just scream. I can remember this very clearly. I can remember a time when I was in speech therapy in nursery school. The teacher was using a blackboard pointer to point to the students to do something, and I was just screaming every time she aimed the pointer at me. I screamed because I was taught at home that you should never point an object at a person because it could poke out your eye. What do you suggest to the parents who have autistic children? I am a big believer in early intervention. 
You've got to keep autistic children engaged with the world. You cannot let them tune out. Research is starting to show that a child should be engaged at least 20 hours a week. I do not think it matters which program you choose as long as it keeps a child actively engaged with a therapist, teacher or parent for at least 20 hours a week. As the talk continues, answer questions. You are one of the first people in the field to stress the importance of sensory problems in autism. What are your current thoughts about this issue? I have been a big believer in making people aware of the sensory problems in autism, and these sensory problems are variable. Donna Williams wrote about a monochannel approach where she either has to listen to something or see something, but she cannot do both. I was the type of child where they could just jerk me out of autism by saying, now come on, pay attention. But you cannot do this to the children with more severe sensory problems. In these cases, you have to question whether there is a biological reason for the bad behavior or a behavioral reason. If sound hurts a child's ears, there is no way you can make him not be scared of the school bell. A mother who has a five-and-a-half-year-old child with PDD wants advice. Her son attends a pre-kindergarten classroom with 22 other students, and he's starting to become aggressive. The mother says that her child has selected a particular child in the classroom and places him in a chokehold position. I do not have enough information to give full advice. Since PDD and autism are strictly behavioral diagnoses, they are not absolute diagnoses, such as Down syndrome. The PDD label is used because he is affectionate and interested in people. These are two very different types of PDD labels, and they are like apples and oranges. Since the child is aggressive towards one particular child, we need to figure out why is this happening. Is the other child teasing him? In any case, a behaviour intervention is needed to stop this behaviour. Thank you, Doctor, for sparing your time and talking with us. It was a great pleasure in having a conversation with you. Thank you. The pleasure was all mine. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. You will hear a lecture given by a geography lecturer to his students related to seahorse and its species. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Seahorse is the name given to 54 species of marine fishes in the genus Hippocampus. Hippocampus comes from the ancient Greek hippo, meaning horse, and campos, meaning sea monster. Seahorses are mainly found in shallow tropical and temperate waters throughout the world and live in sheltered areas such as sea greases beds, estuaries, coral reefs or mangroves. Four species are found in Pacific waters from North America to South America. In the Atlantic, H. erectus ranges from Nova Scotia to Uruguay. H. zostere, known as the dwarf seahorse, is found in the Bahamas. Colonies have been found in European waters such as the Thames estuary. 
Three species live in the Mediterranean Sea, H. gutulatus in the long-snouted seahorse, H. hippocampus, the short-snouted seahorse, and H. fuscus, the sea pony. These species form territories. Males stay within one square meter habitat, while females range about 100 times that. Seahorses range in size from 1.5 to 35.5 centimeters. They are named for their equine appearance. Although they are bony fish, they do not have scales, but rather thin skin stretched over a series of bony plates, which are arranged in rings throughout their bodies. Each species has a distinct number of rings. Seahorses swim upright, another characteristic not shared by their close pipefish relatives, which swim horizontally. Razorfish are the only other fish that swim vertically like a seahorse. Unusual among fish, a seahorse has a flexible, well-defined neck. It also sports a coronet on its head, which is distinct for each individual. Seahorses swim very poorly, rapidly fluttering a dorsal fin and using pectoral fins located behind their eyes to steer. The slowest moving fish in the world is H. zostere, the dwarf seahorse, with a top speed of 1.5 meter per hour. The earliest known seahorse fossil are of two pipe fish-like species, H. sarmaticus and H. slovenicus, from the coprolytic horizon of Tungis Hills, a middle Miocene horizon of the Slovenia dating back about 13 million years. Molecular dating finds that pipefish and seahorses diverged during the late Oligocene. This has led to the speculation that seahorses evolved in response to large areas of shallow water, newly created as the result of tectonic events. The shallow water would have allowed the expansion of seagrass habitats that selected for the camouflage offered by the seahorse's upright posture. These tectonic changes occurred in the Western Pacific Ocean, pointing to an origin there, where molecular data suggested two later separate invasions of the Atlantic Ocean. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking you cut guesswork. Please guys participate in every day new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.